In January of 2018, I was detained in Iran. In January 2018, Connecticut resident Murad Tabaz was taken hostage while in Iran. Over the past six years, I've had the privilege and the challenge of working with tirelessly for Murad Tabaz. My name is Richard Blumenthal, United States Senator from Connecticut. My name is Murad Tabaz. I'm a uh, a nature conservationist. Murad is a conservationist. He is a person of immense grace and dignity that was demonstrated under the most demanding conditions when he was kept in cruel to kind of triple captivity in Iran. I had started a conservation foundation 16 years ago and uh, grew to become the largest uh, wildlife and habitat conservation um, NGO in Iran. So in 2018, my wife and one of my uh, children came to Iran and on uh, wanting to return back to the United States, I was uh, notified at the airport that um, I could not leave. Murad went to do photography and conservation. Iran, in effect, was using him as a pawn as a hostage. We, we want him back, and we want him back well. We, we don't want him to be suffering more than he already is. We're all still here and waiting and hoping we'll get to see our dad again. The government really had no idea initially how to deal with this issue because Murad was one of a number of Americans and find their criminal. Who was also in Tehran. Murad Tabaz was a Western resident who was um, uh, br brutally and illegally taken hostage by the Iranians. He spent six years um, in Evan prison. And I hadn't seen it. I worked for six years with the senators and with White House and all sorts of people. I'm Congressman Jim Himes. I represent Connecticut's 4th Congressional District and as ranking member of the Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence. Murad Tabaz is a, he was not a spy. He was not an asset of the United States government. He was doing conservation work in Iran. And I think the Iranians sort of saw an opportunity to, um, you know, take somebody who would ultimately be a negotiating pawn for them. I was constantly told that, you know, once they had all the information they needed, that I'd be free to go. Instead of saying, so you, you're, you're free to leave, I was blindfolded, handcuffed, thrown in the back of a car, and taken straight to having prison. This prison was one of the hellholes of the world. It was designed for torture, for breaking people. It's a pretty lawless regime in Iran, and so anybody who's perceived as, you know, politically problematic could be sometimes tortured, even executed in Evin prisons. Murad was deprived of decent medical care. He could have died, easily could have perished in that prison for lack of proper medical care. And it was within the first few weeks that one of my colleagues and co-founder died in prison. He was a couple of cells over from me. They claimed that he committed suicide. Frankly, uh, I didn't believe it, and not it as anybody else. And my medical records were routinely uh, taken away by the IRGC intelligence unit and not shared. Um, in, in one particular case where um, I got hit in the, in the left side of my head uh, pretty hard, and I uh, lost hearing in my, in my left ear, um, when I was at the hospital and got to examine everything, and uh, one of the interrogators who, who, who would always come, you know, he, he took the reports away and didn't let my wife have them and, and literally just tore them up and threw them out because the report said 
that uh, um, the hearing loss was from trauma. Iran's judiciary says four more people have died as a result of a fire at Tehran's Evin prison. There are now a total of eight reported deaths in the fire. On Sunday, officials had said four people died from smoke inhalation. According to the authorities, the fire was caused by a riot in a workshop. Rights groups are calling for an independent investigation. It was a programmed event so uh, it, it wasn't they, they made it sound as if the prisoners got out of hand and they set fire to the stuff the truth is they they had planned for uh this event they i mean before the fire uh they had collected all the fire extinguishers and taken them out of the uh, uh various prison wards but it was pretty uh um traumatic. I mean, they were shooting directly into the prisoners. Uh, some, uh, uh, some are snipers, uh, but a lot of them are kind of just like riot police and shooting uh, with um, uh, shotguns. One of my key roles was to make sure that State Department, the National Security Council, the White House didn't forget about Murad and the other U.S. hostage. Murad was not alone. You know, I kept pressing the State Department, the White House. Uh, There is an Office of Hostage Affairs in the White House. In Murad's case, he was a citizen of America, of Great Britain, and we tried to enlist the Brits in gaining his freedom. We were in touch with all of the British governments throughout this period of time, as well as United Liz Truss's foreign secretary told the Speaker of the House, told me in a meeting that they would not leave Murad behind, and ultimately they did. So that was a moment of very real pain. Well, what throws you off is when you suddenly learn that it was a massive effort to get you out, and then it collapsed. Those are, those are uh, mentally very trying, extremely trying. I mean, what happened with the British... That, that took a little time to recover from. That took some time. So we dealt with the British ambassador. We dealt with foreign diplomats who might have contacts in Iran with the regime, and most prominently with our National Security Council staff, the State Department, and at various points, the President of the United States, all focused freeing Iran, first and foremost, he was our priority. Among all the Americans and others kept hostage. The Biden administration had been talking with Iran for years. They had constantly been raising the issue of these Americans. What would it take to bring them home? We're going to continue to work to bring home every American who continues to endure such an injustice. When it comes to our efforts, we continue to work night and day to secure the release of our wrongfully detained citizens, and that includes U.S.-U.K. citizen Murad Tabaz. My name is Michael Shear. I am a White House correspondent here at The New York Times. Ultimately, the deal was one in which the Iranians would release the Americans, the Americans would release a number of Iranian prisoners in the United States, and crucially, the Iranians had about $6 billion of revenue that they had made through the sale of oil that was in a bank account in South Korea, and for all sorts of technical currency-related reasons, they basically couldn't spend any of it. So the United States didn't pay anything. The United States said, if this deal goes through, we will allow the Koreans to remit that $6 billion of oil proceeds, not our money, not taxpayer money, not U.S. money. But the U.S. said, we will not stand in the way of that $6 billion being conveyed um, for the sole purpose and the auditable purpose of being used for um, humanitarian uh, uh, ends. So the deal is right. There's an argument that critics of the deal make that says, look, all money is fungible. And if the Iranians wanted, they could use some of the money they already have on things like supporting terror groups uh, around the world uh, and use the money from this new account for food and medicine and humanitarian purposes. 
I want to ask you about the deal. Six billion dollars that Iran has, its own money. But what is your expectation of its use? We're told that it's for humanitarian purposes, food and medicine. Do you believe you have the right to use that money in any way that you see fit? This money belongs to the Islamic Republic of Iran, and naturally, we will decide, the Islamic Republic of Iran will decide to, sp to spend it wherever uh, we need it. So if I hear you clearly that it will be used for more than humanitarian purposes in your view? Humanitarian means whatever the Iranian people need. The situation with Murad Tabaz and his imprisonment and later release is part of a much bigger struggle uh, throughout the Middle East. The world would be a much safer place if the Iranian regime weren't, I'll just use the word, evil. In thinking about Iran, it's a, it's a low point right now. But we should never give up on the possibility that in relatively short order, things could be different. Why do I say that? Um, we fought a brutal, brutal war against Germany and against Japan in the 1940s. Today, Germany and Japan are probably some of our closest allies globally. As tough as the moment looks right now for Iran, we shouldn't dismiss the notion that if there's change inside Iran, we could, we could be looking back 20 years from now the way you know, we look back on the remarkable growth of the relationship between the US, Germany, and Japan. But at the end of the day, until they decide to come into the 21st century, they decide to you know, no longer brutally oppress their own people and destabilize the region. When they make that decision, all doors are open. Look, Iranians are enormously talented people, very well-educated, doctors, engineers. They're desperate to engage with the world. Um, they're going to need to take a big active role in changing their own regime because when that happens, you know, I think the U.S. and Europe will be more than willing to engage with a new, more enlightened regime. In Murat's case, there's some lessons here. One is, don't go to Iran if you're an American citizen. The other is, don't go to other places in the world where citizens may be seized, where Americans may be used as negotiating pawns. We try to warn people about going places that are dangerous, not only because of the danger to them, but also the damage to our national interests that may result if we have to negotiate for their freedom. You know, Iran has continued to use hostage taking and hostages as leverage in their relations with other countries. Despite the uh, success that the U.S. had in getting in bringing this group home, I, I, I don't think there's anybody in the U.S. government that thinks um, that this is going to be the last time they're going to have to confront this problem.